It is a uh, particular honor today to uh, introduce Dr. Melvin Patrick Ely, who is a member of the faculty of the College of William and Mary in the Department of History. Other people I'm admitting, but not seeing him yet. So I'm, yeah, call me back. He is currently the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Humanities. Professor Ely grew up in Richmond. He earned his BA in, at Princeton University with study in history, a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Texas in Austin, and a PhD from Princeton University. He has taught at Hebrew University and Yale University prior to joining the faculty of the College of William and Mary in 1995. While at Yale, he received both the prize for outstanding scholarly publication and research and the prize for teaching excellence. After coming to the College of William and Mary in 2006, the governor of Virginia presented to him the Commonwealth's Outstanding Faculty Award. The book about which he will be speaking today, Israel on the Appomattox, has won the Bancroft Award, which is presented by the faculty of Columbia University for an outstanding work in uh, diplomatic history or history of the United States. And he was also um, named as a editor's choice on the New York Times Book Review and Atlantic Magazine. Um, New York Times Book Review and Atlantic Mag Magazine. So he comes to us with a great deal of um, appreciation and acclaim for the work that he has done. In his work, he has explored the American South and the role of African Americans in American culture. In an earlier work, The Adventures of Amos and Andy, a social history of an American phenomenon he traced, for example, ways in which radio and television portray the relationship of the races in this country. It is with honor that I uh, present him today to speak to us and share his thoughts on Israel on the Appomattox. Professor Ely. Well, thank you very much for that uh, gracious introduction. Uh, I want to thank my friend uh, Besida White, uh, who uh, is the person responsible for my being here. If this goes well, she gets all the credit. If it doesn't go well, she had nothing to do with it. I'm going to uh, talk, uh, in fact, about this a free black community that uh, the Reverend Mr. Uh, Dr. Pritchard uh, uh, spoke about. And I'm going to tell you largely a story about African Americans, but I'm going to start uh, very beginning. I'm going to talk a little bit about white people. And some people were a little bit disappointed in uh, reading my book that within the first 50 pages, uh, I dispense with the, the white story and shift mainly to uh, a black story, but that's the way the cookie crumbles and that's the way it's going to be today. In 1796, a young Virginia planter, cousin of Thomas Jefferson named Richard Randolph, sat down at his mahogany desk and did a very unusual thing for somebody of his age. He wrote a will. I don't know whether he anticipated an early death. If you read his will, it doesn't seem as though he did, although he proceeded to die rather promptly within a, a period of months. This will of his is one of the most interesting documents, I think, in the, the whole panoply of American history, because the first half of the will doesn't really have anything to do with what he's leaving to his uh, wife and children. The first half of the will is an abolitionist uh, diatribe. It's uh, where Richard Randolph talks about how terrible slavery is and how regretful he is at having had any part in it. He had a part in it because his father left him 
a, a, a large number of enslaved people, about 150. Richard Randolph inherited these people at the age of 21, and almost all of them had been mortgaged. You could mortgage a human being back then the same way we mortgage a house now. These people had been put up as collateral for loans, and they couldn't legally be freed until those loans were paid off. So this is the situation in which young Richard Randolph found himself, and I'm going to read you a sentence and a half from his will, keeping in mind that in those days, they wrote long sentences. I'm quoting now. He writes, with an indignation too great for utterance at the tyrants of the earth, from the throned despot of a whole nation to the more despicable but not less infamous petty tormentor of individual slaves, wretched slaves, whose torture constitutes his wealth and enjoyment. I do hereby dictate that it is my will and desire, nay, my most anxious wish, that my Negroes, all of them, be liberated. I thus yield them up their liberty, basely wrested from them by my forefathers, and beg, humbly beg, their forgiveness for the manifold injuries I have too often inhumanly, unjustly, and mercilessly inflicted on them. Now, there's no evidence that Richard Randolph was a cruel master, he seems to have believed that the very act of owning other human beings was by no definition cruel, unusual, and inhuman. And to put him in a little bit of context, that was an unusual point of view in 1796, but not unique. His uh, Richard's stepfather, St. George Tucker, uh, shared that uh, belief. Richard's teacher at William and Mary, George Wythe, shared that belief. Now here, we ought to draw a distinction. There were more than a few white Virginians who understood that slavery was wrong. Thomas Jefferson understood, understood slavery was wrong, but he never liberated anybody. Uh, he sold a fair number, but he didn't liberate anybody until his death, and then only people who were blood-related to him. Richard Randolph not only thought that slavery was, uh, was wrong, he believed that the, the races were equally endowed. They were literally created equal. He thought that, and his stepfather thought that, and George Wythe thought that. And if the races are equally endowed by their creator, then there's no justification at all for slavery. So Randolph leaves this will, and he specifies that he's going to attempt in his lifetime to set free all of those people uh, who, whom he has come to own. And if he dies first, he wants the debts to be paid off and his wife to see that these people go free. And not only that, but that they receive 400 acres of his land on which to settle. These are reparations, reparations for uh, half a lifetime or a full lifetime of unremunerated labor. So he's going to provide them with land to settle on and the means to support themselves. That's very unusual. Uh, George Washington did a, a somewhat similar thing. He left a will uh, with, with uh, uh, provisions for freedom for, uh, for his uh, enslaved people and for economic help for them. But Richard Randolph went uh, further even than uh, than Washington. Now, Randolph, as I say, promptly died. And when he died, it took his wife, his widow, 14 years actually to set these people uh, free, uh, partly because they were mortgaged and they couldn't legally be freed until those debts were paid off. And here, there's a, a, tragic, a tragic dimension because in order to pay off those debts, some of the enslaved people had to be sold off in order that, that the, other might, the others might eventually go free. Also, I think Richard's widow was less committed than he was to the idea of uh, e emancipation, but in the end, she was faithful to the vision and in uh, Christmas, New Year's uh, season of 1810, 1811, she actually did 
set free about 95 enslaved people in Prince Edward County and uh, Cumberland County. And she carved out for them 350 acres, it turned out, that was going to be their land on which they built a community. The name of the community, the name that was selected by the African American settlers themselves was Israel Hill. And it is on a hill. You can go there today. Why Israel? I don't have any documentation of this, but I have not the least doubt that these uh, freed people, some of whom at least I know were devout Baptists, were invoking the story in the biblical book of Exodus of the delivery, the, the deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt and their eventual arrival in the promised land. So this community of 350 acres, Israel Hill was the promised land for the people uh, whom I'm gonna be talking about for the rest of this uh, presentation. Now, as of 1811, these Black Virginians were free. There's about 95 people, as I said. And what, did, what exactly did that mean? Well, it's, it was something far short of the freedom that white people enjoy. If you were a free black person, you couldn't vote, you couldn't hold office, you couldn't serve on juries, you couldn't serve in the militia, you might have to pay certain taxes that white people didn't have to pay, you had to register with the county court and carry your registration papers uh, with you, you get the idea. It's something like a second or third class citizenship. But that doesn't mean that the freedom that these people had was devoid of meaning because they did have the right to their own persons, the persons of their, uh, their families, un unless a, a free black person married a, a, an enslaved person, then there were complications that we'll talk about later. But basically you owned yourself uh, you could make your own decisions to a, a great degree. You could acquire property if you uh, attained the means to do it. You could buy it, buy property, sell it, bequeath it to your children. Uh, you could do business. And to my surprise, I discovered you could even, a, a free black person could even sue white people in the county court. And more often than I thought, win these lawsuits. Now you couldn't testify in criminal court against a white defendant if you were black, but paradoxically you could sue, you could file a civil suit against a white person. So you have the white, the right to own property, to multiply your property, to make money, uh, to be a free person and to file suits. And these are meaningful freedoms. The reason I know they're meaningful is because I know what the Black folk who had these freedoms did with them. My story, my Black story starts with a man named Hercules White, who was one of the first to be uh, uh, freed and the most prominent within the Black community of Israel Hill until his rather early death. He was a cooper a carpenter, a hauler, a hauler of cargo, a, uh, a slaughter of hogs, an investor. Uh, white people owed him several hundred dollars at the time of his death in 1812. And his uh, children and grandchildren and other people of Israel Hill went on to become uh, important economic players in and around the town of Farmville members of the white family, white is their name, they're, they're black people, but their surname is white. Uh, they uh, bought and sold at least 13 town lots in the town of Farmville. They'd buy a lot, they'd build buildings uh, so that the property appreciated, then they'd sell it, they'd sell it at a profit. They uh, owned, uh, th they went into a, a business uh, arrangements with white people. They borrowed money from white people. They lent money to white people. They ran boats up and down the Appomattox River. A lot of the cargo uh, traffic from uh, Piedmont, Virginia, down to the Tidewater in those days 
was uh, carried along the, the rivers, the uh, uh, one of which you're uh, near the banks of right now, a lot of you. On the Appomattox River, the traffic was carried by uh, a type of boat called a bateau, a marvelous kind of craft. It was 50 to 60 feet long, only six feet wide. It could carry five to seven tons of cargo in uh, 20 to 22 inches of water. That's not much water. Uh, I've, I've seen bathtubs that were filled uh, fuller than that. The bateau was uh, run by a crew of three. There was a, a, a captain, as he was called, in the rear uh, uh, wielding a, a tiller to stir with. And there were two, uh, I mean, to steer with. There were uh, two other men, one on each side of the boat with a long pole. And they pushed the boat along with these poles. The 70 miles from Farmville to uh, Petersburg, where you could go with the current, and then they'd push the, the boat back 70 miles to Farmville. And I found that by 1850, something like 40% of the bateaus in Farmville, the running out of Farmville, were not only run by uh, free Black people, but owned by free Black people. This is serious entrepreneurship that's going on. Uh, I mentioned the right to sue white people. Why is that important? Well, it's important if a white person owes you a debt and doesn't want to pay you back, you have recourse. Even more important is the fact that, as I said, you can't testify in criminal court against a white defendant. And that means, suppose you're walking down the road one day and a white guy comes up and uh, uh, takes a poke at you. What is your recourse? You can't, uh, you can't bring criminal charges unless there's a white witness who's willing to testify. But what you can do, and what I found at least 19 free black people doing, is you can go to court and file a civil suit. And when black people did that, they were almost as likely to win their suits as white people were. Something that surprised me uh, a great deal. Another thing that surprised me is the degree of interaction between white and black people. I already talked about the business dealings, but I found that the first Baptist church uh, that was, was formed in Farmville, it was formed under the leadership of a white pastor, but the first two members to join were uh, Sam and Phil White, free black men of Israel Hill, promptly joined by about two dozen white people who apparently thought nothing uh, odd about joining a church that was, was founded uh, in large part by, uh, by black men. I found uh, people, uh, in, in one case, white and uh, free black people hitching up wagons and moving west together. I even found uh, white and black people settling down together as husband and wife. Now, by the 19th century, it wasn't legal in Virginia to marry across racial lines, but these were people who, who were uh, de facto married, remained married for life, raised children and, uh, and, and grandchildren, and were occasionally interfered with, but for the most part were, uh, were left alone. Now, how was it possible that there was this degree of interaction between white and black people. Now here we, we, we have to issue a, a, a disclaimer, and that is that the, the freedoms that free black people did have, they, they had in effect by permission from, uh, from white people. It was a white dominated system, it was a white supremacist system. So these are meaningful freedoms, but the freedoms ex exist because white people allow them uh, to exist. The question I just asked a moment ago was, how was it possible that there was this variety of interaction between uh, white and black people? Part of it has to do with shared values. I found that the black entrepreneurs and the white entrepreneurs uh, had similar value, they were all business. They liked money, they liked to make a profit. 
Uh, they were looking for opportunities to make a profit. If you were a white guy and you could make money by uh, uh, dealing with a, a, a black man who owned a boat, you would do it. And if you were uh, a black fellow and you could, could make money in partnership with a white person, you would do it. They both were uh, driven by a work ethic uh, which they shared. They, they both, the enterprising people of both races looked down upon what they considered to be the idle people of their own race. So in a way, the white businessman and the black businessman had more in common than either had with the, what they would have called the riffraff of their own race. The same is true in the church where white and black people worship together. Now they, they uh, had segregated seating in there, but as I said, the Baptist church was co-founded by white and black people. Both uh, white and black people, when they uh, converted and uh, presented themselves for baptism had to uh, narrate for the, the congregation, their conversion experience and the conversion experience of a black person and uh, that of a, a white person were considered to be equally valid. The uh, religious life was complicated uh, in a way that I hadn't anticipated, which is that I found that there were there was a certain uh, fad among uh, young men to harass religious worshipers. They'd shoot guns off outside the church. They would threaten uh, worshipers uh, at, at times. And all of the people who I found doing this were young white men. And I came to realize that the black Baptist, the free black or enslaved black Baptist sitting in that church and the white Baptist sitting in that church are both threatened by these ruffians, these white ruffians outside, and they have far more in common with one another, infinitely more than they have with the, uh, the, the white people have nothing in common at all with those, uh, those white people outside who are harassing them and their black uh, 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 brethren and uh, sisters in the church. Uh, I, I found also there were a lot of white people who were only barely literate. And when they tried to write something down, they wrote English the way they spoke English. And I came to understand that the way a lot of white people spoke back then and the way they kept time and the way that they understand the, understood the seasons of the year were very similar to the way uh, 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 black people did all of those things. The idea that there's, there's some kind of uh, a divide between black and white culture existed back then, but the divide was not understood to be as broad as it is now. So you have all of these interactions between white and black. You have uh, free black people facing restrictions that are very important and also having freedoms that are very important. And you start to think, well, maybe this society wasn't as bad as we thought. Yes, it was. You go through the record, at least I did. I thought I knew a lot about slavery. I'd been uh, studying it and teaching about it professionally for 20 years when I started researching this book. And, and, and even I was uh, at times shocked you uh, find something I already knew. Frederick Douglass tells, the, tells us this in his uh, 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 memoirs, that the thing that uh, the enslaved person feared the most, most of the time was the death of the master, even if the master was an awful, cruel person, because that master dies, or for that matter, that master goes bankrupt. And the people he owned get cast to the four winds, families get separated children from, from parents. I've seen children as young as six or five or even four removed from their uh, parents. And I don't care how benevolent the master thinks he is, if he dies uh, with, without any money, the people he owns, as I say, are going to be cast to the four winds. So you find in 1842, a uh, sheriff's auction in uh, Buckingham Courthouse, Virginia, where the uh, sheriff is auctioning off the property of a bunch of white people who have died uh, 
essentially bankrupt. And of course, a lot of that property consists of human beings. And so in uh, two days, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm finding uh, 120 black human beings are sold off through no fault of their own, needless to say, because their masters are bankrupt. And the record shows that most of them were boys and girls. So that shows how cruel the system could be, even when somebody wasn't trying to be cruel. And that's before we get to the fact that Virginia was the great supplier of enslaved human beings to the cotton states, the internal slave trade out of Virginia. The number of people sold out of here is in, uh, I, I don't have an exact figure, but it's, it, it, it could be a million people. People, uh, again, family separated, people going down, uh, being sent down to, uh, to pick cotton under uh, pretty brutal uh, conditions. One more anecdote, if you want to call it that. In 1861, the Civil War had just started in an oat field just outside of Farmville. An enslaved man, a young man named William, was harvesting with some of his uh, fellow slaves. And he took a wheat cradle. That's like a great big scythe, you know, like the Grim Reaper is pictured as, as carrying. And basically cut off one of the legs of, of his master, a man named Hillary G. Richardson. And of course, William was apprehended and put on trial for murder, a trial for his life. What happened at the trial was, there was testimony, abundant testimony from white people and slave black people, all saying the same thing, which is that William, the defendant had been brutalized he had lacerations all over his body. His eyes had been gouged uh, with a stick by his master. He had been beaten from head to toe by the same stick, had been chained to the floor while he slept. His master Richardson had taken pliers and pulled teeth out of William's mouth, apparently just for the, the, the sadistic uh, 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 thrill of doing it. I mean, it's, it's horrific, unbelievable stuff. And again, white and black people are both testifying to this. And in fact, there's no, there's no way that William was going to be acquitted in Virginia in 1861, but his life was spared. The, the charge was, uh, was bumped down to second degree murder. In a fair system, he would have been acquitted on grounds of self-defense, but even, even white slaveholders weren't willing to take this man's life after what had happened to him. But the problem here is Hillary Richardson had a reputation as a brutal master. Everybody knew he was a, a barbarian and had known it for years. And yet Richardson had served on the county court. He had served as county sheriff and nobody ever said a word against him until he was uh, lying in the grave. So if you want evidence, and I know you don't need the evidence that the system was irredeemable, that human body is irredeemable, there it is. And when people come to me and say, well, my ancestors uh, were, were kind to their slaves. What I think is number one, you don't know uh, whether they were or not, but let's, let's suppose that they were. They were still part of a system that allowed the kind of uh, brutality that I'm talking about and a kind of system that routinely even if it was at times involuntary and voluntary broke up uh, broke up families so what i have to do as a historian is i have to walk a kind of tightrope where on the one hand i want to talk about the cultural similarities between white and african american people in the old south i want to talk about the surprising array of relations that existed among white and black people I've found things that I think most people don't know about the way that system operated. And I want to tell them about those things. And yet I have to do it without allowing people any latitude at all to start thinking, well, maybe the system wasn't that bad. 
I'm dealing a nuance here. I'm talking about a system that was that bad. And at the same time, uh, it was inhabited by human beings who had a variety of relationships that you would expect in a community of uh, thousands of, of human beings. That's the paradox. And when people say to me, well, you know, slavery was bad, but the people who uh, uh, participated in it didn't really understand that it was wrong. My response is that my research shows that people of each race recognize the humanity of the other. Every single day, they engaged in interactions that showed that they regarded the other as a human being. And yet, even in a society where you regard the other as human, you have one group of pe members of one group holding the other group as property with all the implications that that bears. And I've told you what some of the implications are. So I'm telling a story that's complicated and not everybody wants complexity. I'm hoping that some of you do uh, because that's all I've got to offer. And I'm going to close this part of my remarks before we go to questions and answers by just telling you that I'm about halfway through writing my next book. And in a way, it's a sequel to Israel on the Appomattox, because what I'm doing in this book is I'm talking in Israel on the Appomattox, I'm talking about relations between uh, white people and African Americans who are already free uh, before the Civil War. In the coming book, which I'm going to call A Horrible Intimacy, I'm talking about relations between white people and enslaved African Americans, which was 95% of the people in Prince Edward County and most parts of uh, Virginia, 95% of the black population was enslaved. And I'm talking about master slave relations, and I'm talking about overseer slave relations, and I'm talking also about the relations between uh, white people who didn't own slaves at all and uh, the enslaved uh, uh, folk. That's where I'm going next. I'm writing it actually in the form almost of a screenplay, and we'll see whether that works. But the reason I'm doing it that way is that I think that what we have here is a history that is full of drama, it's full of tragedy, it's full of sadness, it's full of black achievement. And that's a, that's a major takeaway here, is what people of African descent were able to accomplish in spite of all the obstacles that we've talked about. I'm trying to tell a human story here, and I think uh, I'm gonna stop talking now. Thank you very much. Well, watch out for it. Hold on just a minute. Shelby, you can. Professor Ely, thank you so much. And uh, I, I want to start with a question of my own and then see if we've got some other uh, questions. Um, and I think we've got some. Um, that we, we do have some questions on the line, but I, I just wanna start about one local reference here. Uh, in the 1790s, Robert Carter III of Lancaster County, which is um, the, the county just north of Middlesex on the other side of the Rappahannock, uh, was uh, left a will in which he emancipated 500 people. And, uh, it's my impression, I may be wrong, that the, the two stories we've, uh, that story and the story that you tell may be the largest number of people liberated uh, in uh, antebellum Virginia. Uh, so my question is, were you able to discover any connection um, between the two other than uh, sort of sharing in the same general culture? I don't know of any, uh, I didn't find any specific connection, except that uh, they're both they're both Randolphs, right? But then every every third Virginian was a Randolph back then. So that doesn't necessarily prove anything. Uh, you're right about the, the uh, uh, 
I mean, uh, uh, Carter, you know, he has the surname Carter, but they are, they are some kind of remotely blood related. Uh, Carter's manumission, I think, was the, the largest by dint of numbers in, in uh, Virginia. Uh, the, the, the Washington manumission was bigger than, uh, uh, bigger than Richard Randolph's. And, and there were a few others who, who uh, would rival in, uh, in, in, terms of numbers. I'm not aware of any connection between uh, Robert Carter and uh, uh, Richard Randolph, except I assume they had, uh, they had similar uh, motives. There's a book about, uh, about the Carter uh, manumission uh, by a guy named, uh, I think it's Andrew Levy. So that's, that's out there too, for anybody who wants to read about it. And of course, that's the family that, uh, that's, that uh, built the fabulous, uh, Christ Church, right? Which is, uh, yes. yeah, which is well worth a visit. I'm sure many of your, many of the people in this gathering have been there, but if you haven't, you should go, go out there and have a look. Okay. Um, a second question is, um, which has been uh, uh, sent to me is, does the Israel Hill, the Israel Hill community still exist in the 21st century? If so, what is it like? Is there a group of Israel Hill descendants in Prince Edward today? Okay, the the Israel on Israel Hill does not exist anymore. Uh, but uh, actually, when I started working on this book, there was one family still up there whom whom I inter interviewed in their own house. So they're not there anymore. But there is a community of Israel Hill descendants whom I interviewed for this book. And uh, I interviewed, in fact, uh, two uh, women who were rather elderly at the time who had grown up on Israel Hill. And their pictures uh, and their stories actually appear in my book. Now, about the Israel Hill uh, descendants, a few years back, a... Uh, Virginia Highway historical marker was was set up at the site of Israel Hill, and we had a dedication ceremony there. And the descendants of the Israel Hill people turned out in very large numbers. I'm pretty sure we had 150 people out there that day, probably two thirds of whom told me that they were uh, descendants. So they, uh, yeah, they're, they're still going strong. I talked to one gentleman who said that he grew up in Farmville, but he used to walk up the railroad tracks to, his, to, to stay with his relatives on Israel Hill every weekend. And that was up into the 1940s. Uh, what happened then was that uh, a, a lot of black folk from uh, Virginia were moving north to get jobs. They were moving to Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and so on, Boston. And the, the population just just thinned out and dwindled on, on Israel Hill to the point where there was no longer a black community up there, but the memory lives on for sure. Thank you. Um, I, am in, I would encourage others to, to post questions. And uh, I have another one I wanted to ask. I, I have heard, um, I have, in the last month was at a or heard a presentation when someone said kind of cavalierly without explanation that promises to release people from captivity in wills were easily made and also easily defeated so that in some cases the promises were made and heirs and others and the court overturned those promises so I, I take it that um, Judith um, did something, the, the widow um, did something uh, significant when she followed through. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about her own connection and background? Well, first, let me confirm that uh, you're, you're right about the, the heirs wanting to uh, defeat these wills, because uh, if you think about it, you're a, a, a white uh, heir, and uh, this will is read, and the the will is is calling for the uh, the the freeing of 
10 people, 20 people, 30 people. And, and that's the main form of, of property. And under the law, it was property that you were going to inherit. So you're going to lose out there. And there was rarely a will uh, that attempted to set Black folk free that white heirs didn't contest. In fact, Richard Randolph's own brother, the rather famous John Randolph of Roanoke, left a will in which he uh, called for some 300 people to be freed. And that will was tied up in court by his heirs for, uh, for 10 years. They were contending he wasn't in his white, right mind when he wrote it. Finally, the will was upheld and the people went free. And he left money, by the way, for them to be transported to the free state of, of uh, Ohio. And they were transported there. And when they got off the, the riverboat, the white people of that part of Ohio were there to tell them, no, they were not going to settle there. So the white prejudice was, was about as bad up there as it was in Virginia, and those people were scattered. And uh, until a few years ago, they were still trying to get restitution for that. So that's why Judith Randolph really turned out to be kind of a stand-up character here, because instead of contesting the will, she actually carried it out. And she had two surviving sons who could have profited. Uh, she had to move into a small house. Her, her way of life, her lifestyle, if you want, really uh, had to be ratcheted down because of this. And yet, just to show you how pervasive slavery was, when Judith moved into this smaller house and freed all these folk, she turned around and bought uh, four or five uh, uh, enslaved people herself to take care of her house. She, she still couldn't wrap her mind around the idea that you, that you could have a, a slavery-free uh, existence. Okay, uh, another... No, that's a, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm done, I think. Thank you. Um, one of the questions we've been asked is, where did you obtain your main primary sources for this work, for your book? Okay. Uh, almost all of my sources are the county court records of Prince Edward County, which unlike a lot of counties in Virginia, those records were, were beautifully preserved. They never burned, uh, the, the, uh, they were never uh, lost, they never deteriorated. It's a wonderful set of records that are held in the Library of Virginia in Richmond. And here you have to understand the county court was not just, a, and not even mainly a court of law, the county court was the governing body of a county. So anything and everything that went on in that county uh, or, or anytime anybody sued anybody, uh, all of those records are there. So uh, let's say B Billy sues uh, 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 Sammy. Uh, in that lawsuit, Billy tells his whole story in writing, and then Sammy tells his whole side of the story in writing. And, and some of those litigants are, are, are Black folk who were essentially denied uh, the right to, to learn to read and write, but they tell their stories in court. So you have uh, 80 cartons or whatever it is of uh, records from pre-Civil War uh, Virginia uh, County Court, and that was my source. Thank you. And, and a few interviews, as I say, with people who grew up on Israel Hill in the post-Civil uh, War era. An another question, you've pointed out that the Israel Hill community <coughs> no longer exists today. Mm. Um, what were the Israel of uh, the, the Israelites, the members of the community, able to hold on to their real estate uh, in the years after the Civil War, or was yes. it a late 20th century, uh, mid 20th century phenomenon that they lost the property? No, they they hold they held on to it, and I I, I don't know for certain, but I, I don't think that they necessarily lost lost their land through. Uh, uh, some uh, calamities or something in the 20th century. I think I think some probably sold and uh, sold out and moved moved on or moved on and then sold. Maybe maybe some uh, uh, lost a foreclosure or something. I don't. I I just don't know. I don't think they were run off of there. I just think that the Great Migration happened and and the population thinned. Thank you. Are there? I think we're getting to the end of it. You, you've got some compliments here that are coming in the, the chat box, thanking you for the presentation and a, uh, um, a promise to buy a copy of the book, 
and the, the, the last slide that I will show will be one that shows the uh, where you can buy the book. And uh, so people will, will have that information. It's uh, available in electronic and paper form. Um, and, and Amazon uh, still thinks they can uh, uh, get it to people in time for a Christmas present. Okay, great. Okay. Um, when do you expect your next book to be published? Well, uh, if God is gracious, I will finish writing it in the year 2021, and then it'll probably take a year to, in, in production to come out. Thank you. If there are others with questions, ah, um, here, uh, other questions are, are coming. Um, I'm always curious about how free black, how freely black people were able to move around. And you have mentioned people moving to the West, for example, relocating yeah. uh, to places where the Israel Hill community would not have been known. Yeah, well, uh, the mobility, uh, physical mobility of free black people and, and enslaved black people was, uh, in principle, it was it was restricted. I mean, if, if you were enslaved and somebody owned you, then you were supposed to have permission of your master to move about. If you were free, a free black person, uh, there were there were laws against moving from one county to another without uh, without uh, permission, or uh, free black people moving from other states into Virginia without permission. Now, in reality those laws were kind of intermittently enforced. Uh, I found a lot, of, uh, a lot of mobility, a lot of uh, black folk from other counties moving into Prince Edward and people from Prince Edward moving out of there. Now, if, if white people, if some white person at some point wanted to enf enforce that, that always existed threat in the background, but there was really a lot of mobility. I mean, slave people, if you were a slave, you were supposed to have a written pass to leave your master's land. And the fact is most masters were too, what, distracted or lazy to bother with that. So there was a lot of mobility, a lot of moving around, especially at night, so that spouses could visit their spouse. You know, a man and a, a, a woman who are, are husband and wife live on different plantations. You, you would go try to visit your family or you would go and uh, maybe in your, in your off hours, you, uh, you made shoes or something like that. You'd go out and, and, and trade at night. Now, again, if a slave patrol came along and wanted to ask for passes and you didn't have one, they could whip you. But a lot of the time, there was a, a, a pretty fair amount of, of mobility, unless, of course, you tried to escape. And then the, the, the odds of, of getting away to a free state were almost negligible. In uh, Williamsburg, it was the case that if somebody who uh, wanted to, to punish an enslaved person uh, was squeamish about doing it, you could get the the county to administer punishment. Yeah. Uh, so so their records uh, is, it, it results in a set of records about who was being beaten and who was asking people to yeah. be flogged. Uh, was that the case in Prince Edward County also? I I didn't I didn't find that there. But of course, the, the, the overseer performs a function, something like that. If you're a big enough uh, property holder that you have an overseer, one of the reasons people had overseers was because if they were squeamish about inflicting physical punishment, they could hire somebody who wasn't squeamish. And I'm saying, by the way, in the chat that uh, the follow up to that question about yes. mobility, somebody's asking whether if uh, his or her ancestors lived in one county, might they be related to a family in an adjacent county? Emphatically, yes, that's very possible. Yes. And you okay. see uh, the further question about entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, well, the, the entrepreneurs, uh, they, they would live in, um, 
well, not not uh, sumptuous surroundings, but they 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 would uh, live in a good good respectable uh, house of the, that a, a person of of middling income would probably have. Now there were in the state of Virginia, and even more so in certain other states, South Carolina, uh, Louisiana, especially free people of color who were actually wealthy. Uh, none of those were in Prince Edward County, but uh, uh, Goochland, Buckingham, there were uh, uh, several very well-to-do free Black families. Of course, they're the exception that proved the rule. Thank you. Uh, at this point, if there's anyone who would like to unmute themselves and uh, to uh, direct a question directly to Professor, Professor Ely, I think we have a little bit of time to do that. Uh, so you, um, but I would ask you after you have asked your question, if you would you please mute yourself again, uh, because lots of open microphones do create some trouble with bandwidth and the possibility of others um, uh, others hearing what is said. But are there any? Uh, uh, would anyone like to ask? I have a follow-up question. This is Patricia Satchfield, who badly typed the last question concerning the entrepreneurs. I do know how to spell, believe it or not, but my fingers don't know how to input it. Oh, I didn't even notice that. My question that. was more addressed to those members of the uh, community who were not entrepreneurs. Okay. How did the balance- Oh, the typical, uh, the typical life, I, I see, I misread the question. Yeah, the typical life uh, of, um, okay, there, there's the, the free black folk who had uh, land, and that's true of the people of Israel Hill. They, they would have lived, most of them, uh, modestly, but uh, with, 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 with adequate uh, surroundings, adequate appointments and so forth. But the majority of free black folk uh, worked for white people. And that meant that they would live uh, a very probably among the enslaved population of whatever white person they uh, worked for. And those were uh, what you'd call minimalist accommodations. You know, that's a roof over your head and uh, uh, four, four walls and a certain amount of, of, of food, but it was uh, a kind of Spartan uh, existence. That's, that's the way a, a great many uh, free black people would have lived. And then it got to be where uh, th there was industry growing up in Farmville, the tobacco uh, 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 manufacturing uh, industry, even before the Civil War. And at that point, you started getting uh, whole neighborhoods of free African-Americans and enslaved African-Americans who were hired out living in neighborhoods together in uh, rented rented quarters near the factories that they worked in. And I don't know a lot about those accommodations, but I would think that those were quite uh, modest. I mean, not, uh, not at all uh, luxurious. Now, I see there's a related question about the income and lifestyles and so forth. Did free black people have slaves? And the answer is, yes, yeah, some of them did. The majority of those who owned enslaved people actually owned members of their own family. They, they would buy, let's say a free black person would uh, marry or choose as a spouse someone who was enslaved and they would buy that, that person uh, so that uh, the white uh, master would no longer control that person. And then they might not legally set that person free uh, because there was a law that said that any uh, black person who was freed in Virginia after 1806 could be required to leave the state. And that was almost never uh, enforced. But if you wanted to be real careful, you might keep your spouse and or your children technically as your property. Now, there were free African-Americans who, who bought enslaved people for the same reason white people did, which is to make money. Uh, that was relatively rare in Virginia. It was not uncommon in Louisiana.
Yeah, I'm looking at the other uh, chat questions here. I'm, uh, uh, there's one about whether uh, Randolph knew about Carter's manumission. I'm trying to remember the um, chronology of that. I think I think the Carter. Robert the, Carter was first, and he also was a young man when he, uh, I think, 1791 uh, was his manumission. 91. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know whether I, I I don't I can't imagine Randolph not knowing. You know, if Car if Carter were first and it were it were that big of a, a manumission, I, I suspect that uh, uh, everybody in Virginia knew about it. I'm guessing. Uh, let's figuring out who enslaved his or her ancestors, uh, how might how might you discover who the 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 enslavers were? And you know that's the type of thing. Uh, beside a white, uh, really ought to answer that because she's uh, she has a African American genealogical society, and and uh, she knows she'll run rings around me on that question. I know it's difficult to do, but there are ways. Of, there may be ways for you to do that. So oh, I have a, a, a general question, and um, that would be about the premise of a first emancipation. That is, that's the title of a book of about 20 years ago, but it, it talks about the period between 1775 and 1808 as America's first emancipation. It's the period of time in which Northern states that abolished slavery did so though in some cases they adopted laws that took 20 years to uh, come to completion uh, by giving people their freedom when they reached an age of 25 or 30, some additional age. Do, do, do you see such events as Israel Hill as a kind of Virginia's participation in that general spirit of, um, uh, people did apparently notice the, uh, the incongruity of claiming that the British were despots for not giving rights to Americans while holding despotically other people in enslavement. Right. It, it, so was there a kind of window in which people, uh, was this just a case of a couple extraordinary people or, or are we in a period of time uh, after the revolution when revolutionary ideas strike people's minds and there was there was a period uh after the revolution in in virginia where uh there was a fairly widespread feeling among influential people that it was incongruous to hold people in slavery having just uh, rebelled against not only rebelled against great britain but if you read the language of the declaration of independence or the, the patriotic language of the time the allegation was that king george iii was enslaving americans uh patrick henry talked about uh we never submit to the the bonds or chains uh, the chains of slavery so they were even using the language and that's why in 1782, one year after the Battle of Yorktown, the Virginia legislature passed for the first time a law allowing individual slave owners to free enslaved people. Before that, it had to, you had to have an act of the legislature to free a black person from slavery. Now the legislature said any individual who's moved by conscience or whatever can, can set uh, people free. And it was under that law that Richard Randolph was uh, operating. So yeah, there's a there's a period like that where there's a feeling of unease about slavery. And then, uh, but there are always people who are arguing against this. There are always white people who are saying, no, slavery is good. We ought to hold on to it. And they argue back and forth for years. And finally, in 1806, they, they reach a compromise. And the compromise is, yes, white people can still set enslaved people free, but if they do that, the newly freed people are supposed to leave the state within one year. So the hardliners got the expulsion clause and the ones who, who wanted, who still had qualms about slavery got the right to, uh, to manumit people. And as you point out in your book, um, in effect, Israel Hill was uh, grandfathered because the the will that set them free predated that 186. 
Right. And, and for that to happen, the local white authorities had to be had to be willing. I mean, it was basically the county court decided that uh, that Israel Hill was was exempt from the expulsion clause because the will that set them free had been written before 1806. Exactly. Okay. Well, I, I thank you for asking questions. Do you have any final comment or summing up uh, or. Um, my summing up is that uh, I, I, I love talking to and listening to, even if it's only through the chat box, uh, intelligent, engaged people. And I've, I've had that in abundance here. So I, I'm just so thankful to everyone who has uh, attended and uh, certainly to those who have organized this. It's my great privilege to have been here. And it is our privilege to have, uh, uh, to have been um listeners to you today. We appreciate very much. We uh, apologize that you were not able to come to Middlesex County and meet us uh, in person uh, or renew friendships in person. Um, one of the things that this local area is known for in Middlesex County is our oysters. And uh, we have a small token of thanks for your speaking to us today. And I understand that uh, even as I talk, beside a white will hit a button and you will be sent a gift certificate uh, for Rappa for the from the local oyster company. Um, Rappahannock Oyster Company will uh, uh, sells gift certificates, and we have one coming to you. Uh, and we hope as you uh, enjoy those oysters, you will think of Middlesex County. And we look forward to the time when we can uh, meet in person or renew friendships in person. Well, I look forward to that too, and you can be you can be certain that at every at every bite you will be uh, I will have a mental picture of you all. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone uh, who has uh, worked on this and attended this presentation, um, and I look forward to the opportunity for us to have other uh, online presentations. Um, if you uh, look at our um, site, you can see a discussion about an event we plan, we hope for sometime next year at uh, Locust Grove Farm. And we also plan some events for when uh, Saluda is uh, formally designated as a historical district, but please watch our website. And uh, I will close by sharing a web, uh, my screen, uh, uh, a PowerPoint, which will give you the information about how you might get a copy of Professor Ely's book. And, and, and thank you again so much. I, I hope all uh, are, let's see if I'm able to do this as well as I, yes. So this is a slide which uh, shows you um, some of the places that this book is available. I hope you all will be self and uh, safe. And I thank you all for your participation uh, this day. Have a good evening.